Hello and welcome to another edition of Bulldogs Unleashed, a look inside the club and the game of rugby league brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Special guest this week, uh, Trent Hodkinson and Corey Payne. Joining us once again, of course, to have a look at last week's game and next week's game is the great Luke Goodwin. Thank you for coming, gentlemen. We're ready for another ripping round of rugby league, although I must say the last two weeks have not been so ripping. Well, it depends on what you define by ripping. Uh, Braden Burns and Declan Casey come in on their respective wings, Luke, as we look at this week's team list. Jade Nockenball on the bench, Corey Waddell starting. I suppose it could have been a lot worse. It looked like they were dropping like flies this week. Yeah, it's been tough. It's been a tough couple of yeah, a month, actually. A couple of going down a train like we spoke about last week, but um, Declan gets his chance this week. So Braden Burns, he had some bone bruising last week and he's fully recovered from that. And uh, yeah, Ox goes back to the bench. And once he starts in the back row, so uh, he's been great for us this year, I think, Corey, Corey Waddell. Uh, we're quite lucky he's, he could play 80 minutes if we needed him to play 80 minutes, so um, a bit excited about him. Being back in the starting pack, but yeah, it has been tough. We will talk in more detail about injuries, the personal toll on injuries. I mean, this bloke here has some stories to tell. There's no doubt about that. A lot of it with this club, of course. But, Corey, um, when when you see so many injuries in the lineup, I mean, as a player, how, how does it affect you? Can you sort of turn a blind eye to it and focus on just who's on the pitch? Or does that kind of thing get at you as well? Oh, look, I think it's, um, it's an opportunity for someone else. Uh, everyone wants to get the first grade jersey. Everyone wants to be in part of that first grade team. Um, so, you know, th- this is, I guess, part of the game, the, the injuries, part of, you know, week in, week out NRL. People um, get injured, people can't play, and then someone gets an opportunity to step up and get be, be part of the first grade team. So, um, yeah, like it's, it's very hard to say, uh, you know, at the moment uh, for the club, I feel like a couple of probably big names are, are out and, Players that probably bring a lot of confidence to other players. Um, Kick out probably being a big one, and dare say that the Fox brings a lot of energy and a lot of confidence as well. And having him out for an extended period of time is, is not good. And then you sort of go, oh, well, we now we lose, you know, up and comers like Karaz, and it starts to then probably question, you know, some of the young guys that are coming through. But the the more I guess tenured, seasoned players, they're the ones that sort of step up and fill the fill the gap and. As I said, it's an opportunity for another another bloke to get his chance coming to the team and, um, you know, hopefully string a few games together. It's an interesting point, isn't it? When a team is developing, continuity is so important and particularly, as Corey said, certain people doing some talking out there. So it makes it hard. Yeah, it certainly does and that's why it's so important to have that depth as well. You know, as Corey said, um, you know, the next man's up, next man up, you've got to be ready. Those younger guys can step in now. Um you know, a lot of experienced guys that have gone down, but they'll still be around the club, so they just won't be out there on the pitch. So good opportunity for some young guys to step up and, and have a good crack. Well, Braden has plenty of experience, and Declan had plenty last year, probably more than he thought he'd get. Remember that debut? He had that really unfortunate uh, opening game, but, boy, he has not looked back. No, he's tough, Deck. He really puts his body on the line. Um, plays like a front row. Oh, he's a tough kid, a real good kid. A bit hard on himself at times which we've spoken about, but yeah, great kid. Um, like you said, Hojo, we've got a lot of kids that are coming through, um, you know, and I think we might see them towards the end of the year. There's no need rushing them because there's not penny stations. We're long off that, but we have got a lot of a lot of good kids uh, are coming up, you know, Larry Zergo, yep. uh, they're coming first. Uh, our flag are coming first, mm-hmm. they're up there. So got a lot of good young kids that will get their opportunity, you know. So, And that's how we all got to start, wasn't it? Through injury yep. to someone else, unfortunately. Um, and then we're ready to play. Now, everyone picks on wingers. Uh, plenty of jokes about wingers. Although that was a great debate between Hazamil Masri and James Graham in one of our you know, first episode, actually. But if a winger goes down, and this is what's happened to us, it, it does cause quite a ripple through the back line, doesn't it? Now... When you look at interchange, Luke, and I'll get your perspectives, Corey and Trent, in a moment from when you played the game, how much detail is there in the interchange bench in terms of do you look at one through 13 starters and go, right, when he's out, we put in plan A, B or C. How, how much detail goes into that interchange? Oh, it's massive. And even to, you know, you're not, 18th man. Right. That, that's, it's massive too. So you do, you look at it, you know, you, you carry a 14, with my riding zone boys where mm-hmm. they can cover a half hooker, you know, pretty much anywhere in the backs. 
um, and then you, you know you'll carry a couple of middles and a, and a probably an edge you can play middle. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot that goes into it, yes. And especially then your 18th man, where we're going to go with that. So Ox covers a, a lot now. Mm. You, know, you, can, you can put him back on the wing, put him in the back row, and he'll do the job for you. So, you know, am I right? Yeah, I think you need that, is that, that balance with the game. You know, 20 years ago since I sort of played for you, I don't know. What it is. <laughs> but, you know, I think 20 years ago, maybe, <clears throat> I think in your era, uh, 30, 40 years ago, um, <laughs> it, it, it may be like, uh, you know, back then there's you know, a bunch of footballers, yeah. right, that are really, you know, great footballers, yeah. but not a lot of great sort of athletes that are like, you know, trained to be athletes. And I guess then like that period of change through the late 90s, early 2000s, you sort of start to see that professionalism rolling into the game. And I think that changed the game and, and changed the way, you know, you thought about the interchange bench and then it went back to, it went from unlimited to, you know, having a set number of interchanges. Because when I started, you had to play half a game in reserve grade. Mm. Well, then you yeah, that. back up. So pretty much the whole reserve grade. Mm. The bench, everyone got thrown a jersey. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I, I remember sitting up there and, you know, the stand watching you sit on the bench a few times. <laughs> 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 but, you know, like, I, think, I think there's a lot of thought that goes into it now, right? Like, especially now with the... Obviously, the rules around concussion and head knocks mm. and having those yeah. um, spotters in, in the stand, you, you need to have a backup plan. And yeah. I, you need these players like Ockenborn. Yeah, you know, I think I think back to when I debuted in the Dragons, and we had a, a player like Benny Cray who actually started his first grade career on the wing. Mm. So then mm. he came to the to the back row, and you had that flexibility. Then if you need to move into the centres and push the centre out to the wing or whatever that may look like, um, you That's should, like grubs perfect. Yeah. Well, you see a lot of teams, they've got that 14 and they can play front row or they can play on the wing yeah, centres. Yeah. They can cover a lot of positions. It's very important. Yeah. Um, you can't prepare for everybody getting injured, but you can prepare for a couple of injuries here and there. So you've got to be very smart in, in how you approach the side for sure. So there's a lot of thought that's got to go into it. And it's the move away from just the footy player to the athlete as well. So yeah. you've got more mm. big, you know, strapping, fast blokes that can jump. They can do all sorts of things, you know, one to 17. that can all play footy Yeah. Um, as opposed to, you know, where it was, you know, I don't know. A winger was a winger, yeah. front row was a front yeah, row. Could yeah, you put Darren Britt in the centres, you know, like I don't know, right? Yeah. So, like, <laughs> what's, <laughs> the, <laughs> what's the craziest place you've had to play, Corey? Did you ever get really put out of position for at least a short time yeah, in a I, game? I played on the wing, um, one for about five minutes um, <laughs> against Newcastle Knights at Oakey you, Jubilee. And, you went uh, out there on your own, of course. I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> blow You're having a rest. Yeah, pushed everyone in. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I got picked up and spotted pretty quickly. And, uh, yeah, I went back into the middle then. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Um, hooker. I went in the nine and had a little crack at hooker. And my respect for hookers went <laughs> through the roof after that. I, I was coming out third man and being isolated at the A defender. Mm. And I'd just seen this front row licking his lips going yeah, straight <laughs> over you. So, yeah. <laughs> It's, uh, it's tough going in the middle. Now, moving on to a few things that we're picking up trends from in this uh, in this team. The Dogs lead the league in penalties, uh, 7.7 a game. Now, not by a massive margin. The next team's only, I think, 0.1 behind them. But here's the thing. <clears throat> you can have this argument about the way refs team, uh, team, referees uh, adjudicate <clears throat> certain clubs who aren't going so well. That's a whole other argument. We've gone down that road a lot of times. Probably isn't going to get us anywhere. But overall, these penalties, how, how as a coach do you coach that out, Luke? I mean, because it's, it's a variety of circumstances. A lot of them are 50-50 calls. And even Graham Annesley, we've talked about it on this show, even Graham Annesley has come out and said a lot of these are 50-50 calls. 1-3 against on the weekend. That was a big factor. Yeah, mm. so, um, so you're telling me that we get the most penalties in the comp? Mm-hmm. Mm. Give away? Or give, give away. Give, give away. away. Okay, interesting. Yeah, well, like I said, well, yeah, nine three. I, yeah, well, this is only so much you can say, but in my thoughts, but um, yeah, it's tough. And as long as I watch footy and you watch, you know, and it's it's been very well documented, you know, the best referees get the best games. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, I'm a realist too. We haven't been great for the last four to five years. We haven't played semis, so um, you know. But also, we need to take some ownership too as players. Um, that, you know, there's mistakes that we on the field on the weekend where we just drop the ball off first tackles just off a hit up with the right. Well, I want to get onto that because I would call them unforced errors. You know, you can have defensive pressure that forces errors. We all see that. But there are errors that are just stone cold. And you start to wonder, you know, what causes an unforced error? That may seem like a silly question because mm. it's unforced, but there's got to be a reason for it. Um, 
Yep. Fatigue. Is that the fight, most obvious uh, one? A lot of yep. Yeah, I think fatigue is definitely, you know, a huge factor in making an unforced error. But there's also just the, the you know, the concentration and focus, the yeah. focus yeah. that you need to have in every minute of the game. And, um, you know, the moment you start to drift away is the moment you get found out. It's the moment where you make a mistake. It's a moment where, you know, you do come up with an unforced error. Or there's the, the you know, they're just trying to overdo it, you know. And yeah, try too hard. yeah, they're trying too hard, right? So there's... Yeah, I, I don't know the sort of uh, the answer to the, to the thing, but I, I do know that if you're giving away nine penalties on a pretty hot day against the Parramatta yeah. Eels at Parramatta Park, um, it's going to be a hard hard slog to win games like that. Mm. So yeah. Sometimes it's where you give the penalties away. Mm. They seem to get them on the weekend when they needed them coming out of bad ball. Yeah. Mm. You know, coming out of their own end, so it was like, oh. And look, at the end of the day, you don't train to give away penalties. Penalties. You're trained to be tidy. Yeah. Everyone does the same thing these days. It's just how tidy you are in the ruck or certain things. And yeah. calls can go fit. Tension to detail, that's right. And when you get fatigued, your focus lapses, you know, it's just a combination of things. And as soon as you can tidy that right up as a team and, and slowly get that rub of the green, um, it's going to be, you know, a lot better for, you know, defensively attack. You're going to have a lot more, lot we, more energy. We've spoken about that. Having to do so much D. Yep. That when we're ready to attack, we're not asking enough questions. Yep. Mm. Yeah, well, I can see that. Yep. You know, I think it just compounds, right? You yeah, give away yeah, nine penalties yeah. and there's also like some other drop balls and other things that don't go your way mm. in the game. You know, and the game's fast and all of a sudden, you know, you, you lose your winger and this and that and yeah. blokes are puffing and, you know. That's yep. just not us. That's, mm. you know, that's how football flows. That's, that's right. right. That's exactly right. Tries can come very quickly these days. Well, yeah. Um, in fact, I think it's it's uh, it's fair to say it's probably been a feature of the game a little bit more since they brought in the six again rule. Yeah. Um, because it, it it does speed the game up, but it also keeps that team that's made the error on the back foot. Um, so let, let's get on to Cronulla because um, not good timing really. I mean, uh, with injury depletions and uh, maybe struggling a bit for confidence. This is a team that was very impressive in the trials against us. And uh, they've won nine out of their last 11 games against us. Um, uh, the Bulldogs did beat them only a, a – I think that the, the losing streak's only three. But uh, long term, they've got a very good record against us. Uh, and they're playing very well, even though their record, uh, three and three, with the bye, is, is, <laughs> is not a lot better than ours. But um, clearly, they're a very good side. Yeah, they're well coached. You know, I think these two coaches of this weekend's game are the best, you know, two of the best up-and-coming coaches in the game. Most exciting anyway. Um, they are good. Nico Hines. Yeah. Yep. Winner. So, you know, they led well. They got you know, get them around the park. Um, you know, and they got Fanuka and they got some old heads in the team. So, yeah, it's tough. It's going to be real tough. It's another challenge. Every yep. week's tough. Yep. You know. And, and in the losses we've had, it's been against teams that have had a, a, a controlling playmaker who's had a really good game. Yeah, it's obviously very important for you know, a team to have that that, uh, that seven that controls and can be very dominant. Um, as you said, we've come up against teams that have had that and it's been tough going. But um, as uh, as Goodo said, there's a um, good opportunity this week against the Sharks. Hines, best in the game, uh, you know, reigning daily M. So it'd be a good test for us. How do you shut down a play like that, Corey? That'd be your job, wouldn't it? Illegally, of course. <laughs> oh, he wouldn't know how to do that, illegally. <laughs> Uh, hello. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just saying. I think that era's passed us by. But um, <laughs> no, it's, uh, look, uh, I think they're a really good team. I think Fitzgibbon's a, he was a great player. Obviously, he done his apprenticeship under one of the best in Robinson, and you know he's mm. really come on as a coach. And you know, Nico Hines, his quality. I love Finucan. Um, you know, mm. obviously he played here at the club, and I saw yeah. him come through as a junior. He's as tough as they come. He's disciplined and. You know, he, he doesn't take a sort of backward step. And you got, like, Wade Graham in that side as well, who's you know, a seasoned player. Um, they've got some really good players across the, the field. So it's not going to be an easy game. Um, and I th I'll probably just go back to, you know, my thinking on if you give away penalties early in the season, mm -hmm. it's a warm warm sort of night or day or, or what have you. And then, you know, you get caught in making lots of tackles and giving away lots of six agains and all that sort of stuff. They'll just burn you. We're playing, we competed with it here. Um, after 20 minutes, we're all over them. Mm -hmm. You know, and we competed, competed, but then once again, a few mistakes, mm. through turnovers. In, in, in once the momentum goes, yeah, yeah. yeah, very hard to get back, isn't it? And and Ronaldo Mulatalo has a really good try scoring record against us recently. So you know, it's uh, they've got some game breakers there, or at least line breakers. Let's put it that way. Yeah. That's not easy. 
<laughs> has he? <laughs> okay. That's well, legally again, legally, just he'll just be in the way. <laughs> That's how it works, isn't it? Um, so, uh, very important. Long term, Luke, before I let you go, uh, in terms of injuries, anyone coming back, it was great to see Tavita back on the field for a start, but anyone else in the in the shoot to come back soon? It looks yeah. like everyone's at least 10 weeks, though. Yeah, well, around 10, I mean. Yeah, Luke Thompson's a couple of weeks off. He's back to full, a uh, bit of full training on the field now, which is great. Um, yeah, Fox is still well off. Uh, mm. Kicks had his operation. Um, on Monday, so um, everything went well there. So he's just that's a time thing for him. Yeah. Um, Chris Patola, yeah, he's a few weeks away. Bailey's towards him. Um, Jordan Samrani, he's a big center we signed from the Sharks. He's a local junior, so but he's probably a month away. Um, so there, there's still yeah, there's still a lot out, but their rehab's great. It's going great um, under Travis Tuma. Um, and you look at Tavita, I, I believe. Mm. That stint on the weekend was his best stint he's ever had at this club, and this is when we first signed him without an injury. Under the conditions, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's been rehabbing, come out. Yeah, he made a couple of plays, mm. um, but the way he come back in the minutes he played, especially his first stint, <laughs> was it, and it kept, it was had him coming off the kickoff. And, and that freakish offload where Ray uh, – and I don't blame Ray for almost fumbling that because um, it, it, it just came from nowhere. It just popped up. It just goes to show I think the, the team's got to be alert now that he's on the field just no matter what happens. That tackle's not over. Yeah, no, he was outstanding. So, yeah, mate, things are looking up. It's still weeks away. Mm, okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us again, Luke Goodwin. We'll do it again next week. Corey Payne and Trent Hodkinson this week. Our special guest will be back on Unleashed. Tavita Pangai Jr., Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs. I grew up around here. I just love being with a team. I come from a big family, so having a lot of teammates is um, a lot of fun. The fans are important to me because when we need some momentum and they cheer us on, it gives us a lift and gives us extra momentum. So don't let a bet take you away from the match means to me. Is, uh, you're going to miss out on Josh had a car down the line, a chip and chase from Matt Burden, and uh, that's things that you don't want to miss. Betting has affected me negatively, uh, both financially and emotionally. What I would say to a fan before they think about betting is don't chase your losses and pay all your bills, pay your rent, pay your mortgage and pay everything before you do gamble. Don't let a bet take you away from the match. So reclaim the game and be gamble aware. This week's headlines. Welcome back to Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Our special guests this week are Corey Payne and Trent Hodkinson, and we're going to talk about injuries. I know that's going to be painful in itself, particularly for Trent, because we did touch on it. The club's going through a really tough period, but for the individual, Trent, I know you had some really bad seasons. We'll have a closer look at 2012, for example, when you and Corey were actually in the same squad, but you didn't see a lot of game time that year, but then it was only one year in a number of tough years. How do you deal with that sort of thing? Yeah, it was tough. I um, almost gave the game away. I, was, um, I did a uh, medial ligament, my knee, round four against Newcastle. Um, come back from that in Prems, first game back, uh, tore my uh, tendon in my shoulder and they said I'll operate at the end of the year, just get through the year. Uh, the following game I dislocated my other shoulder. So three solid injuries in the one year and I was I was pretty down in the dumps but – Luckily, I had you know some my wife uh, by my side, my family uh, got me through it, and I'm glad I did because then you know some successful years come a few years after that. But mate, it's hard. It's it's very hard. Uh, you just got to trust the process, and the club was very good with me. They were patient. Um, the rehab crew um, at the time was was unreal, um, and yeah, I just ticked all the boxes and worked hard and got back to it. So definitely tough. It didn't really go away though. It plagued you at Newcastle, and when you eventually went back to Manly too. Yeah, look, I was is just it one luck of those. Or, or do you find that some people physiologically are just more injury prone? I don't oh, know. It could be. It, it, it looks that way at times, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I think I think it's a lot of mine were forced injuries, wrong place, wrong time. Right. Um, so, yeah, some guys just get lucky and they play two, two fifty games without an injury and a scratch. And I had uh, 11, 12 surgeries over my career, so it was nice and fun. If it wasn't major ones, it was clean outs, it was stem cells. But look, I had. <laughs> You know, 10, 11 years in the NRL, and I wouldn't change it. Um, mm. It grew me into the person I was. And uh, although I didn't finish the way I wanted to, I was forced to with injury, um, as a lot of guys are. Um, yeah, I had a good knock. 
I remember saying at the time he knew the surgical teams by their first names. He was in and out of surgery that many times. <laughs> Corey, um, you, well, you had a shorter career because you, you retired you early. You knew the pre-meds as well. <laughs> <laughs> I did, yeah. yeah. By, by, by name? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll talk about your early retirement yeah. a little later, but um, in terms of injuries um, – not easy to deal with and I think you see a player go down on the field sometimes and you see the excruciating – you think it's pain but I think a lot of times it's it's concern, isn't it? Yeah. How long will I be out for? Yeah, I, th- I think it's uh, – you know, it's, it's one of those things that when you're young and you're coming through, you're so focused on one thing, it's playing NRL. You want to be in that mm. team. I, and if you don't have that focus, I don't know if you sort of can – be there long term and um, you, you get these injuries and it's sort of part of the game. Some blokes are more fortunate than others. You know, these guys like Cameron Smith, you know, yep. played mm. a very, very long time, never really had any serious injuries. And, and in the middle. The of it. Yeah. 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 And then you look at other blokes and they can't sort of shake it, right? And Like even Tom Trebojevic, I think, is, is a good example. He's sort of been plagued mm. with hamstrings and knees and this and that and it's sort of – Almost your biomechanics sort of, you know, get out of whack and it's very hard to sort of get back into into good shape and be, you know, sound and, you know, knock out some games and get that consistency. But it, it, it's hard watching it, you know, sometimes as a, as a retired player and, a, and as a former player. And I, I've been going out to the footy a couple of times this year and at the collisions yeah. and the head knocks. Mm. And some of the, like, just the, the big hits that, that happen, I sort mm. of look at it now and, you know, that happened to me, you know, and... <laughs> And, and I look at some of these young blokes and it's hard for them, right, because all they all they want to do is get back on the field and, you know, play on. And, you know, I, I look, I, I go and watch a few of the East games um, and the Rabbitohs because they sort of <coughs> get the, the games in town. And I, like, look at Radley, right? Like he just wants to get out there and just mm. wants to play. And he, and sometimes, you know, the, these guys are their, their own worst enemies as well in, in, you know, this injury sort of space. So... It, it, it's a challenging one because you want to get back on the field as quickly as possible, but then when you start having constant injuries, you never sort of it, – it, it appears you never sort of fully recover and it has this mm. compound impact. And, you know, I, I don't I don't know how you prove this, but my hypothesis is, you know, like you do your knee here, you overemphasise over here and then put the pressure on the shoulder. Like I'm yep. making joint yep. dots that may not exist, yep. but like things yep. like yep. this happen, right? And I have heard that. Mm. Yeah. All of a sudden you, you, yep. you find yourself in a position where – Oh my god! I just you know tore the ligament here and I dislocated yeah. this. And how, how that doesn't yep. seem related, but yep. maybe it is. You know, yeah. that's I I personally have a view that you know a, a player like Trebojevic is you know with his bad ankle, then he goes into a bad knee or a hammy and this and that. He needed to go away and do that work. He needed to go away and reset. His, Take some time off. Yeah, yeah reset his body. But it's funny you say that, Painzo. Is when you're young, you want to get back as quick as you can. Um, and I experience that. I want to get out there. It depends what you are with your contract situation. Mm. You know, you mm. don't want to miss out on playing footy. You love it that and much. When you're you a match winner like you, like you, you want you want him out on the yeah. field, right? Yeah. You want him kicking all the field goals. You know, yeah. you want him setting up all the winning plays. So actually, you know, you want to get out there. Yeah. The club wants you out there. Yeah. And sometimes maybe you haven't fully got the recovery that you needed. As That's well. right. Yeah, it's a tricky one. Yeah. Well, that 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 would be a pressure that obviously. The the game today is resisting perhaps better than it has before. I mean, as you were saying, Corey, with Tommy, um, the rehab's been very careful. I know all the clubs really try hard because the long-term future of the player is really important. But mm. individually, how, how tempting was it to cheat a little bit, t- to say to the doctor or the physio or even the coach, um, yeah, yeah, it's okay, I'm not feeling any pain. I don't know. Is, is that hard not to do? Yeah, it is. You know, you, f- you sometimes say you're better – better off than what you really are but you know I thought about the I was always a team first uh mm. had that team first mentality so if I'm getting myself out there and I'm not 100 percent, it's gonna it's not gonna be the best for the team so I was patient but at the same time you know it's you that wants to get out there but then sometimes it's the club pushing you and wanting to get out there and as you were suggesting there Panzo before it's like where's that happy medium of making sure the player's 100% right, you know, mm. sending Tom overseas and making sure he's just got two months, three months off. We're not going to put a time frame on when he's coming back. We're just going to send him over there, mm. get him right and come back. Um, yeah. They did the same with Tavita. Um, he could have come back perhaps a little bit earlier, but they wanted to make sure it was 100% because for the very reasons yep. you guys are talking about, 
And and I suppose the other thing too is medically we're probably getting better all the time, like we are with everything else, in in not only diagnosing but dealing with these things. And it's an interesting point you make, Corey, about the compensation side of things, because even us average people will compensate when we have an injury somewhere. So if you're a finely tuned athlete, that that would be magnified surely, because you guys are on the edge of performance. Oh, look, I think without doubt that has to happen. You know, I. Yeah, think think about you know some things, some, some you know players that carry injuries through games, and in, in years gone by, it's obviously seen as a sign of toughness, and you want to play alongside tough players, and tough players are the, are the ones that you know sort of get you to the to the big games, and you got to carry injuries throughout the year, but you know at times when you're carrying multiple injuries, something else generally mm. you know gives as a result, right, mm. and it sort of doesn't look connected but you know maybe it is you know i mean it's sort of you got to think long term long term is you know do we need you back next week do we need you back in two weeks and then it all comes down to like where the club's sitting you know are they performing what's the depth what's the strength of the, of the squad and uh you know what's the urgency mm. who's the pressure on you know if if there's a different club you know, um, I'm not saying the Bulldogs, but like there's a different situation where someone really needs to win a game. Mm. And someone's potentially not ready. You know, it's going to be a, a tension point there of whether we, you know, inject this player now or we give him another four weeks that he probably needs. And yeah, you know, that's they're the hard calls of coaches and they're the hard calls of clubs and players, right? You've been yeah. through it, Hodge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you, you know it, what it's like. Yeah, and it goes to the individual as well. Every player is different. Every player's body is different. So. Having given this guy an extra week may benefit him. Mm. It may not. It may be worse. You might not, you know, want to get him out there as soon as he can because that's what he needs. Yeah. Um, you know, you see clubs letting, uh, giving players rest mid-season or before the finals. Is that going to be a benefit or is that going to be a negative towards them? Do they need to c consistently play that footy and be running or do they need that break? Is it going to be good for them? So it's a tricky one. It's a hard one. Um, but, yeah, it's part of the game. I don't know how much you've experienced it but – before we move on, what about mental health? There's a lot more emphasis on that now. We've seen players in other sports that have said, I'm stepping down from the game for a few weeks or even months because I'm just not right. It might be because there's issues in their family and all those things. There might be external factors. But I don't know, when you guys were playing, did, did you see that much or was there much of that sort of thing going on? And, and if so, were the clubs aware of it? How hard is it to sort of work that thing, sort of thing out? Are they more aware of it now than they used to be? <laughs> this is a good question, right? Yeah. Because this is super topical, like in in the in the world we live, and it's probably always been, you know, should have been more topical. But I, I dare say, throughout my career, it wasn't something that we we spoke about. Mm. You know, was, we probably spoke about being tough, mm. as opposed to you know, blokes that never, <coughs> um, well openly spoke about having mental health mm. challenges or issues and, and those sort of things. I, I feel like working in corporate Australia, it's uh, a very relevant conversation. Uh, we take a lot of relevant steps to address it and put supports in place and make sure people have the access to counsellors or access to support networks, um, the EAP programs and, and, and the like. Personally, you know, in the workforce, I make sure every week I'm you know, exercising. Not so I look good, you know. Mm. For your mind. But I do look good. Uh, Absolutely. But, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but for, for my mental health, right, yeah. to yeah. get that yeah. outlet, to feel better so I'm a better you know, person at work, I'm a better father at home, I'm a better partner to my wife, I'm mm. a better person in general because you know, I'm able to, to get that endorphin rush of mm -hmm. exercise, right? Mm -hmm. So it, you know, in, in that world it's very much uh, – it's taken, I, I dare say, super seriously and, and we should take it super seriously. We should always seek to understand and, you know, come from a place of positive intent when we're we're having those conversations around someone's headspace um but you know when i played in hockey you know you have your own view on this mm -hmm. i i was you know of the view i just had to work hard and keep working hard and never mm -hmm. wanted to be seen as someone that didn't work hard mm -hmm. didn't put in the extra effort and someone that let the team down at whatever mm -hmm. cost that looked like that was part of you know what i thought and i believed and you know i, I you know i tried to be as a NRL player is someone that pushed through whatever had to be pushed through and, and did my part. Mm -hmm. So um, at what expense, you know? 
Well, well, often it's publicised if there's a death in the family, for example. That the what, what I would say more more obvious things that we we talk about when a player has has been given some time off. But then it's not always that obvious, is it? It's not. It's it's often personal, but something a little more complicated that you can't always talk about. And 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 you have a right to privacy as well. Yeah, of course. You know, rugby league players are human. Um, they need some time off away from work. Um, just like everybody else, and and rugby league is a roller coaster. The old cliche: it has its ups, it has its downs. So it is hard. It's from outside looking in. It's the dream. It's I wouldn't change a thing. But um, there's a lot more to it than just running out and kicking a footy round on the weekend. So um, you know, I think it's great to see guys coming out and talking about mental health a lot more now. I think it's uh, important. I think it's um, a good message message to send out um, to show, and um, yeah, I think it's very important for guys to to address that and. Um, you know, get it out there. Let's move on before we close to something just a little more lighthearted. Uh, the penalty on Tyson Frizzell for pulling Jerome Luai's hair on the weekend. Now, I think everyone agrees now it was an accidental hair pull. Um, Tyson said it was. I think Jerome is probably content with that explanation. Everyone else seems to be. But Graham Annesley said uh, in his Monday review, we can't have hair pulling in the game. Uh, that will be a penalty and he didn't blame the referee for seeing the hair pulled and therefore calling the penalty. I know Knights fans aren't going to be placated by that, but I wanted to ask you guys, we've touched on this a little bit before because we talked about the most annoying things blokes do in tackles, uh, but the, the old hair pull, was it a big deal back in your day? Was it was it frowned upon? Because there, there, there was a bit of long hair when you guys were playing. Yeah, I think, um, who had, I think, Back at the dogs when Marty was here, he had the he had the long hair and he. I, I would never. Who would pull his hair though? Yeah, I Come know, on. but there was somebody that pulled it, and uh, <laughs> I can't remember if he. I don't, a very I, brave man. I think he got a good reef on it too. Whoever pulled it, and uh, they got away with it. So, I mean, look, if you've got long hair and you run the risk of getting it pulled, if it's intentional, yeah, I can understand the penalty. But if it's a mistake and you you're trying to make a tackle and your hair's there, it's very hard to. Sort of ex- accept the penalty, isn't it? Um, he didn't. Uh, it, it was. I'm pretty sure it was a shirt grab that got a lot of hair yeah, in it as well, yeah. and he, it didn't go any further than the penalty. Corey, um, you got to draw a line at the mullet, though. If you got a mullet, surely that's inviting a hair pull. Well, I actually had a mullet <laughs> in 2005. I don't I, remember if that. If I remember correctly, and I, <laughs> to, to the disdain of many uh, many friends and family members, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't mind the mullet. Like I think, I think it's coming back again. Well, you it have to back, defend yeah. yourself, I suppose. It, it is, sure is it back. It is yeah. back, but you know, I think having having long hair, you know, is a is a invitation sometimes <laughs> for a bit of hair pulling. And I, I I can't really remember playing against many blokes in first grade that had really long hair, but I do remember growing up in in this area and playing um, junior footy. Jeff Robinson, you know, yep. you know one of the Famous Bulldogs, yep. toughest Bulldogs, had the long hair. His son, Travis, had the long hair as well. Yeah. Played for Twin Willows. We are playing for Chester Hill. Every chance we got to rip his hair, yeah. <laughs> we, gave him, <laughs> we gave him a tug, you know. Yeah. And it was only when he got to high school. We, we actually would end up going to school together. He, uh, he shaved his head. So, um, <laughs> But I can't remember as an NRL, in, in, in the NRL. Yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot, but that was the one that I could remember. By the way, you'd look good with a new age mullet. Oh, I, don't, I don't know if I'd be accepted at the workplace. You know? <laughs> <laughs> There is quite a variety of hair in the NRL. Let's just say that. We're with Corey Payne, Trent Hodkinson, Unleashed. We'll be back with more after this. Let's go in the sheds. We're back with Corey Payne and Trent Hodkinson, Unleashed, thanks to Reclaim the Game. Now we're going to have a look at the personal lives of these guys who are both very, very prominent when they're playing for the Bulldogs for the community work they did. Um, Corey, you were nominated for a Ken Stephen medal. Um I know all the players are expected to do a certain amount of work in the community. It's part of the DNA of all footy clubs. But this club, of course, takes great pride in it. Very diverse community as well. What motivated you to do the extra? Oh, look, I think the sort of community work that I got involved in, I was very much connected to in, in the sense of I really believed in what, what I was doing and I um, still do it today. And it's very much become part of my you know, identity in, in many ways. A lot of people in my life I've met through – doing the work around education and um, I was a kid that grew up out west, um, you know, Canterbury Junior, Chester Hill Junior and I had mum and dad that were really hard workers and uh, but, you know, never probably had the opportunity to go on and finish, you know, their schooling or attend university. That mm. wasn't something that I guess happened back in the, you know, that baby boomer 
era of the 60s and, you know, it was more about getting out into the workforce, earning some money, you know, and starting, you know, to, to enjoy life. And they were very much, um, you know, very conscious and very focused on making sure their, their three kids um, all had the, the opportunity to go on and uh, study and, and attend university. And probably they'd seen in, in you know, the, their life people that um, they'd grown up with or, you know, they'd met along their journey in, in their own individual lives that had gone on and studied how their life had sort of been transformed in, in many respects. And they were probably, you know, um, motivated by that to see to see their kids have a better opportunity. So, you know, my brother was the first in the family and then I was sort of the second and my sister was the third um, to, to go on and, and study. And we've all gone on and attained multiple degrees now. Um, but for me, what was the, the dif- differentiator and what was, you know, for me – the moti- motivator to, to do something uh, in the community was that I, I grew up out west. I went to, you know, the public school and then I went to Sydney Uni and I was studying a commerce degree and all of a sudden I'm meeting people from very different backgrounds and uh, who were talking about very different experiences and, you know, I caught up with one of these chaps the other day who uh, 20-something years on, we're still good mates and we still sort of catch up for dinner. Two of us, uh, three of us last week had, had dinner and uh, – this fellow, um, he uh, he was a school captain of Cranbrook School, and um, you know, it was a very prestigious mm. uh, boys' private school. And he was actually one of the first people I met um, at university. And um, you know, he said, "Where'd you go to school?" And I said, "Oh, Westfields." And you know, the joke was it was a shopping centre, and you know, like <laughs> it was a bit of a piss take out out of that. But you know, he spoke about getting back from his you know holiday and skiing in Aspen. I'd been up to Foster Tongue Curry, you know. <laughs> Good old Foster. Yeah, good old Foster. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it was a very different sort of yeah. you know, perspective. And, um, you know, you sort of meet these people and, you know, they, they sort of open up your your, your perspective and, and your world and they show you different things. And um, I, I was obviously fortunate to have mum and dad encouraging myself to, to, to go on and study. And, you know, I, I met lots of different people and had lots of different experiences, but I also knew that I grew up with people very similar to me who had the ability, mm. had the intelligence, but probably just missed something in there around a, a role model or some sort of financial support or mm. that encouragement or that confidence or something was missing, right? And, um, yeah, footy gave me the, I guess, the platform and the profile um, to be relevant to go out and talk to kids in schools. Um, and then I was able to talk about my story and encourage kids from – out west to, to go on and continue their studies and and have an opportunity to, to see the world in a very different way and open up lots of different doors and I dare say the hard work that I put in during my playing days to, to continue and, and study and achieve you know a couple of degrees during that time has um, put me in a you know a, a very good position now in my, in my working life and it's opened up a, a whole different world of opportunities I'm seeing you know the, the world in a very different way to I guess how I would have had I have not um, gone on and studied so I'm you know very passionate about sharing that I'm still very active around that I still do a lot of mentoring obviously the the set up a, a not-for-profit many years ago now I think 14 years ago we've been you know 10 years giving out scholarships um, committed a ho- close to half a million dollars in scholarships and we'll, we'll continue to do that for a very long time um, and, and mentoring these kids and you know some of them are I, I mentioned to you guys off, off the camera, but, you know, I train with Dean Hullertow and um, Aaron Warburton sometimes down at the gym. But other days I get the young kids that, you know, were the first scholarship recipients mm. back in 2012 and 13 and 14. I get them down to the gym and I train with them. We do a session and mm. just chat to them, hear how their life's going, see how things have progressed. And also it gives me a chance to informally like mentor them and just, yep. you know, stay in touch that way. So that's something I'm very, uh, very passionate about, close to my heart and, uh, you know, it was an easy thing for me to do. It wasn't mm. a hard slog. It wasn't an ask. It wasn't something that, you know, I had to do. I was forced to do. I was doing for for any other reason other than that's something I wanted to do. And I'm, I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of what, you know, myself and, and, and the guys have been able to achieve in, in that space. So, um, yeah, and, and, you know, footy gave me that opportunity. It gave mm. me that platform to, to be able to do those things. Mm-hmm. And uh, you went above and beyond quite a bit as well. I remember both of you actually. I was hosting functions for the dogs where you were, um, I don't know what the word is, you were acknowledged, I think. I don't think there's any particular awards, but it was acknowledged the work you were doing. And, and same with you, mate. Yeah, I just, I, I just really enjoyed working with the community. I genuinely just enjoyed it. You know, I, I found that 
um, you know, giving my time. Um, you know, we, we trained hard and we were in, you know, around the facilities, you know, quite for quite a while during the day, but we also had a lot of downtime and mm. I wanted to make sure I was doing positive things with that downtime and not just going home and sitting on the PlayStation or doing this. Um, and I just loved the way kids looked looked up at, you know, role models. And I did back in the day. I remember the, you know, the footballers coming into the school and how much that made me happy. And, and uh, you know, I was talking about that for weeks. So I just wanted to... Um, Wanted to give back and, and I genuinely enjoyed it and I felt as though the more I gave out uh, within the community, the, the the better I was playing on the field as well. So um, you're in a positive mindset and, yeah, I just I just love doing it. There was one famous episode where you made the media for helping someone out individually. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, um, Hannah Rye. Uh, I, was, I was up in Newcastle at the time and, and Hannah had reached out um, – well, her mum reached out – I used to do the thing where I'd do the kick for kids and I'd write their, you know, sick children that's been in hospital, um, their name on my kicking tee. As a goal kicker, you get a bit of, bit more air time than, than mm-hmm. other players. Um, so I thought I'd make a positive of that and I was just staring in the up at the ceiling one night. Not, you know, it might have been after a game, not being able to sleep and I just the thought came to me, I just thought, yeah, okay, I might might bring that up and with the, the community person at the time and see if it was available and we got – Involved, involved with the um, with the hospitals, and uh, I had kicked for Hannah that previous year. She mm. was sick, uh, and then I got an update, you know, because I, I like to keep in touch with the kids, and I got an update that she was doing really well, and that was great. You know, I like to hear that. Mm. And then six months down the track, it had come back, and it was more aggressive, and you know, she was only given a few months to live. She had the uh, Ewing sarcoma, and they brought her school brought her formal forward, um, and I just said, you know, let's see if. Uh, if I could go to the formal with her, you know, she might already have a date. She might brush me, but, <laughs> you know. Um, so I, and, and she said, yeah, I'd love to. So I was lucky enough to go to the formal with her. Uh, and it puts it into perspective because here I am, you know, a footballer and I might make, wake up and I've had a bad game or a training session. I've got a pimple on my face and I'm going, oh, no, look at, look at this. And she's sitting there, steroid injections, given an amount of time to, to live and the smile on her face – just enjoying life and living mm. life and it was just a real changing moment in, in my life and, um, yeah, I still get a little bit emotional about it but mm. um, I went, yeah, was lucky enough to go have a, a good time at the uh, formal with her and then, um, you know, not long after that she had passed away. So, um, yeah, just it was a really, really special moment for myself and, you know, I like to uh, keep in contact with her mum and the family still. And How are they yeah, doing? They're going all right. Um it was obviously a challenging time for yeah. them um, for quite some time afterwards and I think they did did struggle for a little bit but, um, yeah, they're doing well. And, look, I, I guess in a sense, um, and we'll, we'll talk about your careers with the dogs pretty soon, but um, the work you guys did, um, both individually and for, for people generally while you were playing, how much did that help you adapt to your own lives after rugby league, I know very different pathways. But Corey, um, obviously, you continued with education. You did retire uh, relatively early, but you you did have a plan, plan, didn't you? Yeah, I think you know there's a common thread, I dare say, between what Hocko just sort of spoke about and how I feel, and it, it's been grateful, right? I, I was grateful for the fact I got education, and I wanted to share that, and yep. you know, share that with others. And Hocko, you know, you, you were grateful for the life of being, a, you know, an NRL player and, you know, you had an ability to help and yep. inspire and change people's lives and, um, you, you know, being grateful is actually one of these things, grateful thinking where it can help you overcome the challenges of mental health issues and, and just being in that mindset can shift you from being in a world of negativity to a world of positivity and opportunity and open up that space. So, you know, I feel like, you know, that... I was always in that space of being grateful for the opportunity that footy had presented, grateful for the fact that I'd been able to study and be able to share. And and I think, you know, being genuine about that and authentic in in, in, in those experiences sort of introduced me to lots of other people um, that opened up my world in, in different ways and, um, you know, sort of, you know, in one way probably – which sort of ultimately was a, it was a large sort of influence on my decision to, to finish my career when I did um, was meeting a, one particular mentor um, who who actually you know took a real strong interest in you know how do you transition out of footy and you know what's mm-hmm. step one what's step two what's step three and 
you know, how do you how do you build that plan? And um, you know, that that chap was super helpful. Um, I actually tried to ring him on the way here. If you know, if you're watching, answer my calls. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know, y- you sort of when you, when you send out this positive, you know, feelings and thoughts, and you, you're doing you know good things, and you, you're being grateful for those opportunities. It's sort of I believe it can come back, right? And mm. um, in in a way, that's you know how I met this particular person, and in in then ha- that person sort of invested into me, and then showed me, you know, um, how he had done it, and you know how I could do it, and mm. you know sort of put it in my mind that this is how you know you, you you could make your exit, and this is how you can start your next chapter, and you know that was sort of built off all the things I'd done. So it, it was, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a good sort of segue out of out of footy into the next thing. I guess a, a lot of guys and, and, and now women do live in a bubble when they get into professional sport and, and the experiences you guys have talked about, I guess, grounded you and that made you realise that there is another life out there. And, I, and, and you've kind of had that in the back of your mind, haven't you, Trent, as yeah. well? Yeah. Look, obviously I was um, retired through injury. Uh, we mentioned, we touched on before, so decision was – essentially taken away from me so I, I didn't um, question that decision whether I retired early or not because I had to so that made it a little bit easier but mm. look I thought I was in a better position than than some guys that um, you know that weren't that may not have had been in the work scene or been in the study scene previously I'd a trade to fall back on which was which was good um, but I'm still trying to find myself now I think it's um, you know, I, rugby league is such a. Um, it, it takes a while, okay. It does. Uh, yeah. yeah. Look, it's, and I think, you know, initially you think, oh, I've played in rugby league. I'll go into the media. Or I'll go into coaching. You know, a special type of person or player um, can do that right away. The mm. opportunities might not come there for some. So, w- what else do you have? Mm. Um, as I said, I had my trade to fall back on, which, you know, I went and I'm, I'm proud of that. I've got back into it and, and I've ticked that off. Um, now I'm going to start to venture out back into the footy scene. You know, I didn't watch footy for, you know, the first year after I retired. I just wanted a break and it had been um, my life for so long that I just wanted to step back and, and just enjoy time. I had a, a, a newborn son at the time as well. So that was that was a good distraction. Um, now I just love watching the game for, for what it is as a fan. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting back into the game now and, and pushing for that coaching side of things or that mentoring or and whatever it is. And that's North Queensland? Yeah, heading mm. up to Queensland, uh, moving the family up there, which was uh, – it's been a bit of a plan. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, be a good lifestyle for the kids. Sydney can be a bit full on these days. So I'm uh, lucky enough that I can go up there and I can continue to work up there and, and, and as I said, get in the footy scene. But, yeah, it's challenging. Um, and I can see why a lot of guys go down a, a downward spiral, mm. but you just got to prepare. And as Painzo said, you got to get um, find someone who can mentor you and put you in that mi- uh, right mind frame. Um, and I had that, and it put me in a better mind frame. But it's still it's a real reality of it, it'll take time. Mm. And well, look, all the clubs are working hard on it. We know that uh, some perhaps better than others. I don't know, but I know this club's trying very hard to prepare players these days for a life after footy, whatever that may be. Corey Payne, Trent Hodkinson, we'll be back to talk about some dog days on the field. Let's talk about the dog days. Yes, it's time to talk about the good old days with Corey Payne and Trent Hodkinson. What was it like when you finally got to play for the club that I guess you grew up wanting to play for? Oh, look, it was a it was a very, very long road. It was a long way around and I... I dare say I thought that sort of time had passed me to come back and play at the Dogs. It was a dream as a, as a kid, grew up, you know, Chester Hill Junior in the halcyon years of the Bulldogs, 94, <laughs> 95, mm-hmm. went to both grand finals. I grew up playing footy alongside Matt Lamb, so spent yeah. plenty of time coming to games, watching Terry, plenty of times, you know, in, in the sheds, um, you know, the great players of, of that, that era, you know, the Brits, the, you know, Dean Pay. Yeah. Jim Dimmick, you know, it was, it was a great squad and, you know, a very successful team. And uh, it was in that local junior system and, yeah, all the permutations of that. You know, you sort of go through Harold Matthews and selection squads and SG Ball and all that sort of stuff. And I got to, to uh, Jersey Flag and we were very uh, successful at that time, that, the Bulldogs um, culture. 01, I sat on the bench in a, in a flag grand final, which was coached by Ricky Stewart. Um, 
some of the greatest players of the game were in there, like Thurston. Um, you know, Asatazi went on and captained New Zealand. Rocky Elson went on and captained the Wallabies. But that's a team, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Matty Utai, Benny Harris. Um, yeah, it was, it was a wonderful squad. And, you know, the, then in 03, we won it um, again. So it's about 20 years this year for, for that flag team. And there's some great players in, in that, you know, in that squad. Um, you, know, you, you know the names, like Sonny Bill played a few games. But Nate Miles, probably the best yeah. origin player of, you know, the, the modern era. Um, for Queensland, he, he was an absolute star when he played up, up in those Origin games. Uh, um, Jared Hickey, Cameron Phelps, Trent Cutler. Um, you know, there's a, it was a <laughs> long list of blokes that actually went on and played a, a bit of first grade. Um, but at that time, there was like a, just an amazing squad, right? Mm -hmm. And the first grade team, mm -hmm. you had the Willie Masons, you had the Marco Mealy's, you had Steve Price, you had Rennie Matua. You know, it was, it was a, an amazing sort of squad and I had the opportunity – to maybe you know accelerate my career, and this is probably not the right NRL speak. It's probably more corporate speak. <laughs> but I had a chance to go to the Dragons, and yep. you know it was more money, and it was an opportunity to play, be part of a top twenty-five squad with a with a great, really great set of players. You know, you, you had the Barretts, Gaznia, Timmons, Cooper, Riles, mm. Hornby. You know, mm. you know Cray ends up being one of the greats. Um, Matt Head. It was a really, you know, um, what looked like a, a team that would go on and probably really have a have a chance at winning a few premierships, albeit that we never really got there under under that sort of uh, you know, approach that during that time. Um, and then that led my career to, to you know the the Tigers, and you know, it was a wonderful couple of years there. We never really achieved much, but I, I really enjoyed being at that club, and I learned a, a ton under Sheens. And you were high profile on that team too, which is why you finished up with the Dogs. Oh, I think. yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> but the, the, the opportunity came up to come back to the Dogs. It was under Kevy Moore. And um, I'd played, you know, second grade, a couple of games when Kevy mm. was, was here as the second grade coach. And it was a one year contract. And, uh, you yeah, know, it was 2010, came back. That was a, a, a year actually after the Dogs had done really well in 09. So it was a rebuild mm. year in 09. Um, they'd bought in Annis, they'd bought in Stag, they'd bought in Hannett, they'd yeah. bought in Kamali, they'd bought in mm. you know, a really good set. And then you had obviously the incumbents of Bobcat and General. Um, it was just mm. in, in, in Lover, Jared Hickey was part of that team, and it was a it was a good squad. But um, after '09, um, sort of was a sideways season. But I was lucky enough to get a contract, one year contract, come back here, and I trained really freaking hard, and I really wanted to be part of it. In the first trial game against uh, St. George Illawarra of all teams, I um yeah had to get a shoulder reco. So <laughs> mm -hmm. I was talk about much, the injury mm, thing. Yeah. yeah, I sat out all season, and yeah, you know, I came back and uh, I played a second grade game out at the the Crest of all places. And um, the next week uh, it was a final round against Manly out of Brookvale, and Kevy said, "Do you think you'd be right to play?" And I said, "Yeah." yeah. <laughs> and I was like. Probably not, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. but it was my chance to be part of it. And it was actually the Father's Day weekend and, you know, it, it was a special weekend for me because I got to make me long-held childhood dream of mm. representing the Bulldogs and my old man was there and, you know, we we, we won and we got to sing the, the, the song in the sheds and it was a great day. And um, for me, it's still probably one of the highlights of my career actually pulling on the, the first grade jersey for the Bulldogs and living out that, that dream, something that I wanted to do. Since I was, you know, eight nine years of age, mm. I remember was that the publicity. Two thousand and ten. Two thousand and ten. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I remember that game because I was with Manly and you pumped us. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's the funny thing because uh, uh, you you were a Campbelltown junior, then you played for Parramatta Juniors, and then uh, you finished up at Manly. Yep. And uh, we brought you over a year before Des. Yeah. So you must have talked him into well, it. That's right. Des he followed me over. <laughs> yeah. So um, he's a wise man, isn't he? It, it, isn't he what? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was a oh, Campbelltown boy, uh, grew up out there, uh, you know, mini magpies and stuff like that, but made a decision to jump over to the Parramatta comp, play for Cabramatta, and then at the same time I went to Westfields as well um, in Fairfield. So um, the competition at the age group at the time in Parramatta was was a bit stronger than the Campbelltown one. Um, we went in grand finals by big margins and right. you know, the same age group at Parramatta were nice and close. So I just thought for my football moving forward it was a bit of a decision – um, in that regard and then yeah just made, played my mats my ball jersey flag Premier League at Parramatta um, and then Manly come on board and, and Noel Clill 
Um, I was actually coming off a knee reconstruction, my first one in 08. Um, so I thought, mm, I'm coming off contract. This is going to be interesting. So Noel Clill come over and they offered um, a full uh, top 25 contract. And that's your dream, you know, when you, you, mm. I was on the tools at the time. Mate, top 25. Yeah. That's all, that's all you're talking about. That's exactly top 25. right. Yeah, and I was like, oh, I'll live my dream. I'll get to play football full time. I'm going to get paid for it. Um, and at the time, Parramatta, they were pretty loaded in the halves. Mm. They had Tim Smith come off that rookie season, uh, rookie that's of the right, year. That's right, yeah. Um, they had, you know, uh, Brett Finch was there. They had... Um, Jimmy Maloney, James Maloney was playing mm. Prem. So he, at the same time I went to Manly, he went to Melbourne, I think, because of the opportunity as well. Um, so, and that's how I ended up at Manly and then spent a couple of years there. And and you had a good halves combination going there. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. I was alongside Kieran. Mm. Um, I went up in 09 and played uh, in the Queensland Cup because Manly's feeder club was Sunshine Coast. They had a two-year stint with the Sunny Coast uh, Sea Eagles at the time and we went up there and we won the comp in 09. That was our first year in it. So we had about four or five guys that would train full time and fly up every Friday. It was it was interesting, but it was good and we won the comp. And then um, funnily enough, Brett Stewart uh, in 2010, round one against the Tigers, I think it was. Um, sorry, two, the, yeah, 2010, injured. So then the backline shuffle, what we were saying earlier mm. in the in the um, yeah. episode, you know how important yep. that is. So. I think Ben Farrow went from the wing out the back. Jamie Lyon went from 5'8 to centre. Kieran Foran went from half to 5'8 and I slotted in there against Parramatta uh, at home in round two. That's right. I think um, I remember that game. Which was, you know, and I was lucky enough to score the try. My first touch, I said, how easy is this? <laughs> and didn't score a try for about 100 games. So, um, <laughs> yeah, did that. Then uh, opportunity come up with Kev in 2011 and Toddy Greenberg and I sat down and, um, you know, had a three-year deal offered with, with some solid coin and, you know, that was a dream to secure my future for mm. three years. Uh, that was quite a long deal at the time. You see the five, ten-year deals these days, but three years back then was pretty good. So mm. I took the opportunity and, um, yeah, really enjoyed and, and settled in nicely with the guys. I want to jump forward. I know you guys came together in 2011 uh, from Trent's perspective, but I want to go forward to 2012 when Des, um, quite controversially, announced he was going to coach the Bulldogs and then in the end he was allowed to go um, by Manly uh, a season earlier than perhaps, well, I think we all knew what was going to happen, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> a, a season earlier than was formally uh, anticipated and, and boy, uh, wasn't Manly upset about that. But for you guys, uh, Trent, you'd be familiar with Des, obviously. Corey, you know what sort of coach he was. That 2012 year, uh, and I know you both had mixed fortunes. We'll get onto that in a moment, but... Um, what was it like, the Des era, when it began? There was a huge level of excitement. I know we talked about all the high-tech stuff that he wanted placed around the stadium in the early days, the, the way the training facilities were, were, were revolutionised. And How was it for you two as players? Oh, look, I, I really enjoyed that year. It was a, it was a fantastic year. Um, James Graham was added to the squad that year. Mm. And uh, I, was a, I was a very different uh, footy player and a, had a very different mindset at that point in my career and what I wanted to achieve and how mm. I wanted to, to be part of it and I you know I've always subscribed to the idea that you learn something from every coach you have and everyone you sort of play alongside and um, Des definitely you know showed a different side of coaching and a different side of how to prepare and a different side on how to win and uh, he brought a, a very different lens to, to the team and a very different level of intensity dare i say in terms of how we how we operated mm. and and how we performed and you know we we, we sort of worked really hard over that pre-season we worked really hard and trained very differently to how we had in previous years and um as much <clears throat> you know it, it was it's just different right and mm. and you know we got off to a, an okay start to the season and yeah, I just wanted to be part of that 17 and, you know, we sort of got in, into a bit of a rhythm and, you know, we actually started to think, you know, we might be um, a chance of doing something. That, that's how I started thinking. Yeah. And I, I definitely know, you know, Jane Booper and maybe Mick Ennis and, and Staggy and a few others would probably start to think similarly and, mm. um, you know, and, and you just build momentum and, you know, it, it, was a, it was a good year. It was a great year and um, obviously culminated in, in the grand final loss but uh, – it, it was a it was a very uh, you know different way of preparing and it was a very different way of coaching um, that I'd sort of been accustomed to and, and you know I, I appreciated the, the opportunity to play under Des for that that season and you know I 
dare say I've taken a lot of learning from from that into you know my my working life. So, um, but yeah, I had a lot of fun as well. There was a lot of good uh, mm. you know, fun in that 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 season that we had. And uh, you know, uh, the only thing I look back on is you know it would have been nice to have won the grand final. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. A different season for you, of course. You only played a handful of games, which yeah. is greatly disappointing for everyone involved, especially you. Yeah, look at. Watching from the sidelines, sidelines and the boys having that success, I wanted to be a part of. But I was still around the traps, and I was excited. I was on the ride with them. I couldn't be out in the field, but you know, I was just excited to be a part of it. And I'd come over from Manly, as I said before, and Desi come over the year after, and I was I was really excited because um, you know I'd, I'd been under him before. I knew what he'd bring. Um, you know, he leaves no stone unturned. He's very calculated, very measured in ed- everything he does uh, to the T. And I remember the boys asking me, they're like, well, you've played under him. What's he like? What's preseason going to be like? And I just went, you're going to find out. <laughs> I knew what was coming. Uh, the boys geez. didn't. And, uh, yeah, they soon they soon understood that um, he's quite a very intense character. And um, as, you, as you mentioned, you know, he, he's very high tech. Mm. Uh, he uh, made sure there was all cameras or certain things around. And, um, yeah, it was good. And uh, that 2012 season, it was, it was, it was a good year for the boys – um, it was exciting. Uh, you could see they were having a lot of fun out there. We had a good crew, um, and but unfortunately it didn't go all the way in in, in the grand final. But um, it, it was, was a distinctive way of playing at the time with the passing forwards and all that sort of thing. Where did that come from? A lot of people say it was Des's idea. Some say it was Jimmy Dimmicks. You hear different stories in the scheme of things, or was it collective? I don't know. I think it was. Um, like Jimmy's a very um, – he was a player that loved to throw the footy around and mm. play football. Um, and I think Des is good at, um, you know, working with what type of player he had um, and adjusting to what their strengths are. And, you know, Corey will say a lot more than me. He was in the middle. He was in the forwards doing it. I was out the back screaming for the ball sometimes. And in, <laughs> vid- in video sessions I'd get sprayed because Desi would go, why didn't you get the ball out the back? I said, I called – Special at the time, I called special, special. and Booper goes, "I didn't, I didn't hear you special. I didn't special." So he'd get let off scot free, and we'd just cop at me and Grubby at the back. So that was his call. He didn't hear it. It wasn't loud enough. But yeah, um, you know, Corey might say a bit more from the from the middle perspective. You were having too good a time, weren't you? Well, I, I think you make a good point, right? Like you got to play with the players and play their strengths. And yeah, you know, two players that spring to mind that were very good ball playing. Forwards, and you don't really see. I, I don't really see it that much in in the modern game. Mm. But like Cassiano, yep. yep, he was a great yep. user of the football, and he, he could you know pass short and the biggest yeah. halfback in the game. They used well, to say at the time, he, he was magic. And and then James Graham, he had a, a nice pass on him as well. Um, and, and it was an interesting, yeah. You know, and, and I think what Des brought to the to the club at that time was structure. Um, and, and really having a definitive way of playing and, and a both definitive def- offense and defense. Hey? Mm. Yeah, yeah, a de- definitive style. Yeah, he, he was very good defensively. I remember Des's manly teams before he came yep. uh, to Canterbury, defending uh, their way into attack. If you know what I'm saying, the, yeah. the offensive defense. I mean, you'll explain that, won't you? Yeah. You might be in your own twenty, but you, you're actually turning the game around without the ball. Yeah, that's right. And he was heavily, as you said. Um, invested in in making sure the defensive side of things was was on point. Um, you know, you had your KPIs, you had all these certain things that you had to hit. Um, whether you were a halfback or a forward, you had to hold your own and you had to do what's best for the team. And you know, he'd bring it up in the video sessions if you didn't do the right thing. And um, you know, he'd spray you no matter who you are, Mickey Ennis, the captain, you yeah. know, the rookie, whatever. Um, but it was good. And uh, you know, as Pumper said, he had that. Um, Painzo said he had that. Um, you know, he was very structured, um, but he also uh, had a way into playing footy. Eyes up footy, um, which was good, you know, to fall back on that structure, but you've also got to play footy as well. So he was a, there was a lot of outside looking in. Desi was um, – he was quite an intense and under-the-radar type of guy, but, you know, on the inside of the four walls, he's very um, – you know, I, I really liked the way that he stood up for his players no matter what. Uh, he took the brunt of that. Uh, he didn't just throw him out to the walls, especially mm. media related, which was good. And um, yeah, he had a funny side about him too, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> what was the quirkiest thing about took, Des? Because he is the nutty professor took, in some ways. He took Booper to court, didn't he? Remember in, uh, internal court? <laughs> uh, the internal uh, court. That was a good one. Uh, oh, look, he. Yeah, he's he's a he's a really good guy. I, I'm indebted to Des for the opportunity that he gave 
uh, me to have something that I wanted, right, mm. and be part of it. I had to work hard for it. Don't get me wrong. You had to train hard mm. and – there was a lot of checks and balances and there was a lot of, you know, things that got inspected. But, uh, you know, to be part of that team, to be part of that squad, to be injury-free, um, mm. you know, it was a special thing and I'll, I'll always, you know, be thankful for, for that. And there's is that sort of coach, right, that he, he really invested in his players and yeah. the players invested back into to Des. I want to just quickly move on to two grand finals. Firstly, the 2012 one. I've never seen so many outside backs knock down passes. At least in a grand final, yeah. as Melbourne did that day. They had a game plan to thwart what we'd done successfully all year. And, you know, that's how grand finals work. It worked for them on the day. How did you see it, mate? Just quickly. Look, I, I think, you know, you can the, – the learning that came out of that for myself was that you can be the best all year. You can be the most dominant team. You can beat other teams. You can do all these wonderful things and put in all these wonderful performances. But – it really doesn't matter if you don't win on the grand final day. And grand final day is a it's a binary outcome. It's one or zero. You either win mm. or you lose. Mm. And on that day, um, we probably got ambushed uh, to an extent where, you know, they came out of the blocks really quickly. They, f- you know, I think they scored pretty pretty early on, and then they were really up in our face, and they really probably you know playing like a grand final. That's, mm. that's all I can put it down to, right? We probably didn't play like it was a grand final in that early early stage. And there was a bit of experience in that Melbourne team in terms mm. of grand final, so yeah. I want to fast forward quickly because we, we don't have a lot of time. Yep. So I love this. We could go for another couple mm-hmm. of hours. But Trent, uh, you got to go. Corey retired, of course, at 28. Uh, and we know what he went on to do in business very successfully, now with Amazon. You went on to 2014, which was a very different season for the Bulldogs, a season where – I think it was – I won't say overachieved. That's probably unfair. But um, a lot of people didn't expect us to be in that grand final. And it happened to be against a formidable team that I think was sort of destined. <laughs> I don't know. Every Everything and everyone was pointing towards yeah. South winning that year. Let's not go there. But it must have been a very difficult one for different reasons. You finally got your chance to play in a grand final yep. after the disappointment of 2012. Mm-hmm. Just what was that like? Yeah, we started the year off great. Well, top of the ladder. Um you know, leading into, I think, early stages and state of origin rolled around. We lost a couple of players and a few injuries and then we sort of, you know, up and down during that period and then coming out of origin, um, you could say there was that origin hangover and, you know, we weren't up to scratch the best we could. So we, I think we ended up finishing seventh or whatever it was and, and we went into that final series playing Melbourne first down there when I think it was 6v7 and, you know, to come up with them first round mm. yeah, at home – was going to be a, a tough ask but as Corey said before even on grand final day you got to be prepared anything can happen and that's where finals footy is so different to you know uh seasonal footy during the year if you're the better team on the day it's you know it, it can it can can be so different on the result we beat um south sydney on the um i think we beat them earlier in the year yeah by mm. by the point um on east so we knew we could beat them on grand final day but Week before we lost Mickey Ennis, which was super important yep. um, to our team. He he had our middles rolling and he just controlled the, the middle forward pack so well. And um, myself, uh, the previous week uh, to the Penrith game, we played Melbourne uh, Manly. Um, I went off, come back on. So we limped into that grand final. Um, I know Josh had a shoulder uh, injection. I had the knee injection going into it. Um, Moses come in and played nine. Um, you know, their nine was out, Isaac, but they mm. had Happy Coruscant coming in, who's a noted nine. He's you know, since, Mo- since proven himself since yeah, then. Yeah, you know, Moses come in and done a solid job, but um, he was more, you know, a half, five, eight type of player. Um, but they were the better team on the day. And as you said, it just felt like they'd aligned to them. But we still, you know, give ourselves an opportunity. I think at the 50th minute it was six all. Mm. And then they just went boom, 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 ran away with it, which was disappointing, you know, looking at that scoreline and, and looking back at it 30 to six or whatever it was. But... Um, they'll be a better team on the day. Uh, we will come back another day perhaps and talk about other things, including yep. your epic State of Origin series with, with Grubb. But yep. um, we'll hopefully get him in if he's not getting massaged uh, to talk about that <laughs> with you. But it's been wonderful looking back and, of course, looking across the game of rugby league and the club with Corey Payne and Trent Hodkinson. Thank you so much, boys. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Bill. We'll hopefully do it all again very soon. 